Well, the Bible reading this morning is Psalm 130. You can follow along in your Bibles at home or you can read it on the screen or off the sheet if you've printed it off. Psalm 130, a song of a sense. Out of the depths I call to you, Lord. Lord, listen to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. Lord, if you considered sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. I wait and put my hope in his word. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for there is faithful love with the Lord and with him is redemption in abundance. And he'll redeem Israel from all its sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray before we begin our time in God's word. Uh, There's an opportunity for you to take notes and then down the bottom uh, is a screen where you can send us any questions or comments and Neil or I will endeavour to get back to you as quickly as we can. But let me pray. Dear Father, it's amazing to read poetry from so long ago. Uh, But whilst these poems were written so long ago, they are so utterly relevant to our lives today. Father, please apply these words to us as we gather as your people in our households for church. And please help us to know the greatness of your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that point one on the outline, uh, The Princess Bride uh, is a wonderful tongue-in-cheek novel. Uh, A wonderful movie. Uh, Both successfully skewer many of the characteristic fairy tale techniques and ideas. Uh, It's a movie and a book that I think everyone should watch and read. Uh, A hero ends up in a crucial moment in the pit of despair. Uh, It's an underground dungeon of torture out of which no one can or has ever escaped. No one but the evil count and his henchmen know of it, so there's no hope of rescue. It's dominated by a massive machine upon which research is conducted, research about pain and tolerance. It's a comic image of something that is so real for so many people, including our psalmist. Just look there at verse 1 and 2. Out of the depths I call to you, Lord. Lord, listen to my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. Uh, In The Princess Bride... Our hero is subjected to the machine to a point where no one else has been. Uh, As he dies upon the machine, and there's a spoiler alert, he lets out an almighty cry that shakes the whole forest surrounding the council, the castle of the count. Uh, The psalmist is letting out such a cry here, but it's a cry that seems directed to no one on earth. Now, we don't know who the psalmist is, We've no indication of when the psalm was composed, but we do know the plight of the psalmist. He's sunk to the depths, out of which he cries to the Lord. The depths is an image of darkness, loneliness, no escape, even death. Uh, It's a picture of a place out of which no human can escape of their own volition or free will once they are there. It's described in a similar way at the start of Psalm 69. It raises images of sinking to the deep, deep pits in the ocean where there is no life, no help, no sound, just bleak darkness. And there's a need here, isn't there? A need for anything, for something to raise this person up. And whilst he's surrounded by silence, he himself is not silent, is he? He cries out. And his cry, his need is relational. He he cries out, to the Lord, to the covenantally faithful, committed God who has chosen to deal with the broken state of this world through the family of Abraham. At this point, we could all nod our heads in a seat, couldn't we? Many of us have been in similar situations, haven't we? A similar place, a similar moment. Many of us have felt the depths, the quiet bleakness of being in a place akin to death where no one, least of all ourselves, seems capable of helping us. And this individual, a member of God's people, has been there without any historical hooks to hang this cry on. 
We could well imagine when it might have been composed, when such a cry might have been called out by God's people, the nation of Israel, Abraham's family. It could have been a night in the desert as they wandered for 40 years after the exodus. It could have been a moment amidst all the madness of the time of the judges. It could be some time during that acrimonious split within Israel into a northern and a southern kingdom, someone on the border as they looked out at the damage around them. It could also be, most clearly, any second of the exile as reports of the destruction of Jerusalem seeped into the camps in Babylon. But such a cry of woe and lament and desperate need raises the obvious questions of why. Why is the psalmist in these depths? Why does the psalmist cry out to the Lord? Well, look there in verse 3. Lord, if you considered sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. Map point two on the outline that whilst there's no frank admission, the answer to why is the psalmist in the depths seems clear. It's sin. It's sin. I want to remind you of the definition of sin that we've been working with lately. Sin is the attitude and action that says I am God and God is not. Sin is both inside, it's an attitude, a mind, a heart, it's expressed outside in action, in behaviour. Sin, we know, is part of the human DNA. As descendants of Adam and Eve, we're all sinners. We all think we can do a better job than God. Uh, to be human is to be a sinner. To be human is to desire to be God instead of God. To be human is to be a sinner. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve first sinned, and so we all sin, sin weighs people down, doesn't it? Remember that? It produces the shame of rebellion. It causes the sinner to hide from God. Even more than that, sin separates humans who all bear God's image from the one whose image they bear from God. We know this intuitively, don't we? I mean, how can any king allow an open rebel to live in his presence? We know this theologically. God states very clearly that sin brings his judgment the removal from his presence, the, the movement into depth. The reality of sin, the truth of sin is captured so well in Psalm 51 verse 4. Against you, you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sins. You are blameless when you judge. Sin is sin because it places I in the middle. It's committed against God alone and it brings his judgment. It breaks the relationship between God and people. That helps us grasp this first truth that the psalmist states here. <clears throat> the Lord judges sin and by right and justice, no human can stand in his presence. The issue here is not fairness. You know how humans cry out in the face of God's judgment and say, it isn't fair. Well, it's a wrong category, isn't it? The issue isn't fairness when it comes to sin and God. The issue is justice. <coughs> By pure justice, when the king is rebelled against for no other reason than I want his throne. By pure justice, he is right in judging that rebellion in bringing the judgment of death. But that truth is matched by another truth, the wonder of forgiveness. You see, if God alone is the one against whom sin is committed, then God alone is the one who can forgive sin, any sin. Now God has displayed this desire very clearly in the pages of history. Remember his just mercy in the Garden of Eden? Remember his amazing commitment to the whole world through Abraham's family in Genesis 12, 1 to 3? Time and time again, the Lord displays this merciful and gracious commitment, this merciful and gracious commitment to forgive his image bearers because only he can. That forgiveness is driven by grace. The Lord showering upon humans what they do not deserve. 
What we deserve is just judgment. And instead, as we cry out, God extends unbelievable forgiveness. And the psalmist knows that truth. It seems fairly clear that sin has reduced him to the depths. It's also clear that when he states, my cry for help, and he acknowledges that the Lord alone can forgive, that the sin that weighs him down is his sin, his rebellion, his personal desire to be God instead of God. He knows that in such depths of despair, the only one who can lift him out, who can deal with his sin, is the Lord. So here's the answer to our second why question. The psalmist cries out to the Lord, because his sin was committed against the Lord. And so the Lord alone can forgive it. That's worth observing, isn't it, that the cause of the psalmist's debts is not the sin of others. It's not the oppression caused by other sin. Unlike, say, Psalm 69, when the psalmist sinks under the sin of other people committed against him, this psalmist sinks under his own personal rebellious Sin. Well, we know what that's like, don't we? It's worth noticing too the way in which the psalmist has responded. <coughs> His is not an arrogant cry or demand. It's not the cry of privilege. It's the cry for help of a man who's come to see that in his sin he has no help except the Lord. That's a state of despairing depth but it's also a state of recognition. He's recognised the nature of his sin, the nature of the sin's effects, the, the real solution for sin, the real human need, and we need to come to know this too, don't we? Again, that cry could come from any moment in the history of God's people. From the realisation after the golden calf episode in The Wandering, to the state of the temple as Josiah tidied up the neglect that had been wrought there, as the people of Judah stumbled into exile, as they sat in exile by the waters of Babylon weeping. And then the psalmist waited. Look there in verse 5. I wait for the Lord. I wait and put my hope in his word. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. I'm at point three on the outline. It's not a thumb twiddling waiting, it's not a sit in the dark and whistle waiting, it's not a drum the fingers on the desk kind of waiting, it's a waiting that has substance (coughs) and expectation. The expectation is clear. It's more than like a man waiting as the watchman on the city gates on the night shift. There's an eagerness in that man, an excitement about the prospect of the sun coming up and when the shift is done, the danger is past and the light is here. It's the same with the psalmist in the depths, but even more, now that the request has been placed before God, before God for forgiveness, he waits for eager expectation, knowing that a moment will come when the danger is gone. And it's not fruitless, it's not without substance, it is tangible, touchable, concrete, discernible hope. There is a certainty that what has been asked for, what has been cried out for, will be granted. And the psalmist states clearly where that substance, where that foundation of his hope lies, it is his word. Put simply, it's in the myriad promises that God himself has stated and which he has fulfilled. And again, this is from every moment in the history of God's people, from Genesis 15 being fulfilled in the Exodus, in the movement out of Egypt, in the promise of Genesis 12, 1 to 3 of land being fulfilled as God's people take Canaan, in the promise of rest that was given, being enjoyed as the Lord gave David and Solomon rest from their enemies, in the promise of judgment uttered by the prophets being fulfilled in two kings, in the promise made to Daniel that the people of the Lord will return to Israel, being fulfilled under the edict of Cyrus the Persian. We could go on and it would be just as exciting. It can be seen in the promise made by the Lord In places like Isaiah 1, verse 18, Come, let's discuss this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they'll be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good things of the land. 
But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Come and talk to me and I will forgive you. The psalmist holds on to the account from God's word of who God is, what he commits to, what takes place. And this is his hope the utter loving faithfulness and consistency of the Lord. He knows that he will come out of the depths forgiven and restored by the Lord as the Lord sees fit because that's the Lord's track record. It's what the Lord has constantly done for those who throw themselves upon his justice and grace and it will happen this time. It's really hard to avoid the way in which there is such a clear connection with Psalm 1 and 2, isn't there? Now, on the one hand, the man planted in the commands of the Lord knows the committed promise of the Lord to reverse curse and bring blessing, just as the psalmist declares. On the other hand, this psalmist is an expression of that last verse in Psalm 2 of the one who takes refuge in the Lord and his anointed one. He's turned to the Lord from the depths at the moment of his greatest need and cried out for forgiveness and restoration. And having come to grasp this truth personally, notice how it's only been first person in verses 1 to 6. The psalmist lifts his eyes and voice to those walking with him up to the temple, the people of the Lord Israel. A look at verse 7. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for there is faithful love with the Lord and with him is redemption in abundance and he'll redeem Israel from all its sins. I'm at point four on the outline. It's one of those moments where we see the psalmist moving from the individual to the communal, from the personal to the community. As they walk up that hill to Jerusalem, to the temple, to where they are destined to meet as the people of God, it turns from being a psalm about I to a psalm about we. An invitation, a call to the whole community of God's people to find what he's come to know the Lord alone can offer. It's almost as if he's talking to his travelling companions and saying, come and meet the Lord and his travelling companions. The travelling companions of the Lord are faithful love and redemption and forgiveness of sins. These three great comforts are only with the Lord because it is the Lord first and foremost against whom we've sinned. And so he alone can bring us into those travelling companions of his the travelling companions of faithful love and redemption and forgiveness of sins. What the individual member of the Lord's community hopes in, so too the whole community of the Lord's people can hope in, that the Lord will display mercy by forgiving the community its sins. And again, such a moment could have happened at many times in the history of the people of God. From the snakes in the wanderings, to the golden calf, through the time of Josiah's restoration and the consecration of the second temple. Uh, Now, I suspect that this was a psalm composed after the return of the exiles to the land of Israel, to the diminished second temple, to the ridicule of the nations. That's my opinion. It's almost certainly compiled into this place in the Psalter at that time. I'm at point five on the outline. But it's not hard to imagine it being composed at that same time too, as the weight of individual and collective sin weighed heavily upon the people of God. They would have sung this song on their annual walk to Jerusalem, to this diminished temple, and they would have waited, and they would have waited, and they would have waited. And then the historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son. You ought to name him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Or as you turn over to Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, verses 4 to 6, but perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? For which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. And Matthew chapter 9, verse 12, but when he heard this, Jesus said, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 11, verse 28. 
Matthew 11, verse 28, come to me, all of you, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We know that Jesus himself is the substance of the hope that God's word committed God himself to deal with sin and brokenness, committed God himself to replace that sin and brokenness with forgiveness and restoration. Jesus is the fulfilment of all such hope, all such waiting, all such crying out. But I think there is more going on here. Uh, Listen to what was written by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He, God, made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Did you catch that? So that our sins might be forgiven. Jesus took our sins on himself, a perfect man, shouldering the judgment of our sins in such a way that Paul says he became sin. And he sinks to the depths of the pit of the judgment of God. And so in doing this, he cried out that he was forsaken. And he called out to the Lord from the cross. Can you see the connection? Jesus himself became in a way that's stated in the Bible, but which I struggle to wrap my feeble mind around. Jesus became Psalm 130. The man in the depths crying out to the Lord, knowing that the Lord alone could answer him and restore him. And we saw last week that the Lord did, that God raised him from the dead, restored him, just as his word said he would. And in that we have the forgiveness of sins that we do not deserve, the forgiveness of our sins that we do not deserve. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Lord has done what he promised. He's dealt with sin, brought blessing, provided the forgiveness only he can and could through Jesus Christ alone. And so sinners can be lifted out of the depths by what the Lord alone has achieved. That's now granted to us, isn't it? As we wait on what the Lord has achieved in Jesus to be revealed in all of its wonder. That means we too now can pray this prayer knowing that the word of the Lord is our hope. And it's important to recognise this truth individually and communally. Individually, we are so often in the depths because of our sinful natures. We know what the Lord has done in Jesus and we know what we persist in doing and it drives us down and down and down into the shame of the depths of our sin. And so we're given this prayer to cry out to the Lord and we know that he'll forgive us constantly as we recognise our need and throw ourselves upon him, calling out to him. He will do this because Jesus is Psalm 130. So let me suggest three areas of application. First, please recognise the seriousness and reality of sin. Sin breaks the relationship between the Lord and us, his image bearers. Sin is relational. And so its consequences are relational, first vertically and then horizontally. And sin weighs us down to the depths because it creates dysfunctional life, a life where we try to be God and we're not even equipped to be God nor meant to be God. Is that how you understand sin? We cannot have our sins forgiven if we do not know the reality of sin. Second, dealing with sin must be relational. It must, it must involve turning to the one sinned against and crying out to him. Dealing with sin cannot be achieved through anaesthesia, through alcohol, through drugs, through indulgence. Dealing with sin cannot be achieved through denial, 
either the ascetic denial that refuses to live in the world or the denial of sin itself. Dealing with sin cannot be achieved through good deeds or overachievement. All of these are individual approaches to sin and they ignore the fundamentally relational core of sin. It's against the Lord. And so it must be dealt in relationship with the Lord. To deal with sin, the invitation is clear, come to the Lord and he will deal with your sin for you because Jesus took his judgment for you. Is that how you deal with your sin? By calling out to the Lord and asking his forgiveness. In that alone is all the forgiveness of sins that we need. And third, as we wait for Jesus to return, to wipe away all the residue and reality of sin forever, we must wait well. well the psalmist gives us some hints. And we wait with eager expectation, looking forward to the day. We wait with our hope firmly in his word, reading it, knowing it, living in God's word. We wait praying Psalm 130 individually and collectively. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can understand it, apply it, because Jesus has lived it. Thank you for Psalm 130, the recognition of sin that it gives us, the recognition of the depths to which we sink, and the wonder of Christ who sank to the depths for us, so that he could pull us out in forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.